So the law of conservation of energy, we're going to start getting into the math now. Uh, so the main idea is that the total energy I start with, if I have any work that's done by outside forces, so an applied force would do positive work, or negative work would be done by dissipated energy or friction. If I do any work on the system, that's going to be added or subtracted, and that will be equal to my final energy. If I have a closed system where no work is done on or by my system, then the total energy I start with is equal to the total energy that I end with. All right, so the energy is either going to be potential or, or kinetic, potential uh, meaning spring potential or, or gravitational potential. And then we have our kinetic energy that it also uh, pans out to. So we have our entire conservation of energy equation. That's all those potential energy, kinetic energy, and then any work that's done. And then that's going to be equal to my final gravitational potential energy and my final kinetic energy, all my potential energy at the end and the kinetic energy at the end. So notice that I start with uh, potential and, and kinetic energy at the beginning. I end with potential and kinetic energy at the end. And in the process of transferring, I may have some work done. If I don't have any work done, then the total energy I start with would be equal to the total energy I end with. You can see the equations here, the gravitational potential energy equal to mass times gravity times the height. The kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the speed squared. And then the work done is going to be equal to some force that's being applied times the displacement of that force. All right, let's look at some examples where we look at the total energy of a system. Uh, so first off, we have a model airplane that has a mass of 8 kilograms and is flying with a height of 24 meters and at a speed of 12.4 meters per second. So what's the total energy of the airplane? So first off, let's look at the energies that are taking place and then, and then we add up the individual energies in order to get the total. So first off, each equation, you got the gravitational potential energy, it's got MGH, you got the kinetic energy, it's going to be one half times mass times the speed squared, and then the total energy is both of these energies added together. So let's start with the gravitational potential energy. You got mass, which is 8 times 9.8 times 24, and that gives us a total gravitational potential energy of 1,882 joules. The kinetic energy is going to be 1 half times the 8 times 12.4 squared, and that gives us a total of 615 joules. So the total energy of the system is going to be that 1,882 plus 615 joules added together, and you get a total of 2,497 joules. This next example, it says a 73 kilogram hiker is running at 4.7 meters per second on a hill that is 21 meters high. What is the total energy of the hiker? So again, we're going to split up the types of energies as well as find the total when we uh, figure out the individual ones, we add them together. So gravitational potential energy, we go ahead and plug that in 73 times 9.8 times 21. Uh, the kinetic, or, I'm sorry, the gravitational potential energy is going to be 15,023 joules. The kinetic energy is one half times the 73 times 4.7 squared. We go ahead and figure that out. That's 8. 806 joules. So when we add up the total uh, together, it's going to be 15,023 plus 806, and that gives you a total of 15,829 joules. This next example, it says uh, a, a toy car has a mass of 1.8 kilograms and is held at the top of a 3.6 meter ramp and released. When the car gets to the bottom of the ramp, it's moving at 8.4 meters per second. What's the total energy at the top of the ramp? All right, so you notice that here it says that it's gonna be 3A. So we're gonna look at actually two different parts of this problem. We're gonna look at the when the uh, toy car is at the top of the ramp and then when the toy car is again at the bottom of the ramp. So uh, we go ahead and split up the types of energies. We've got gravitational potential we got kinetic and we got our total energy so gravitational potential let's go ahead and do that it's going to be mass times gravity times that initial height now you'll notice that i put the the subscript o uh, on the height and the speed is and that's because the um the height that we're, we're looking at the, the initial conditions on this because it has a height at the beginning but not at the end it also has a speed at the end but not at the beginning so looking at the gravitational potential energy 1.8 uh, times 9.8 times 3.6 that gives us 63.0 the initial kinetic energy is going to be zero because it starts at the top it says and it's released it's held and released that means the initial velocity at the top is going to be zero so that gives, gives us zero kinetic energy and then we add those two together we get a total of 63.5 joules now we look at the same scenario, but this time we're going to look at what happens at the bottom of the ramp. All right, so we have our energies, our gravitational potential, kinetic, and the total energy. Uh, we got our equations for each one, but now we're looking at the final height and the final speed 
um, in these equations. So let's go ahead and figure out the final or final gravitational potential energies, um, the 1.8 times 9.8 times zero, because now we're at the bottom. So we're at the lowest point, so zero height. That means zero gravitational potential energy. The kinetic energy, one half times the mass times the speed squared. So that's half of 1.8 times 8.4 squared. That gives us a total of 63.5. And then we add the two together, we get a total of 63.5 joules. So what I want to point out here is how the energy um, at the top of the ramp was 63.5 joules, but that's because all the energy was in gravitational potential. Now, when it comes to the bottom of the ramp, that gravitational potential energy converts over to kinetic energy, and therefore now all the energy is in kinetic, but it's still the same total amount of energy. It just transferred from one type to another. On this example, it says that a 0.15 kilogram baseball was hit, and when it reaches the highest point before coming back down, it's moving at 34 meters per second. If the um, ball is it has a total energy of 168 joules how high is the baseball all right so we have the total energy we have the mass and we have the speed that it's moving at that point so in this one we uh, we actually are going to kind of work a little bit backwards because um, again the gravitational potential energy the the uh, total energy we have these values uh, we know that the total energy is going to be 168 joules so that is actually given in the problem so then we're going to work backwards we're going to figure out that height so that means Means we have to figure out the kinetic energy next. So the kinetic energy is one half times 0.15 times 34 squared. That gives us 86.7 joules. Okay, so if our total is 168 and kinetic energy is 100, or I'm sorry, 86.7 joules, then if we subtract those two, then we get the energy for gravitational potential energy. Whatever's left over is in gravitational potential energy. Therefore, 81.3 joules of gravitational potential. All right, so we use that for our gravitational potential energy equation where we have the mass of 0.15 and 9.8, but the H, the height, is unknown. So we divide both sides by that 1.47, uh, which was the 0.15 times 9.8, and that gives us the height is going to be 55.3 meters. All right, in this next example, it says a toy car has a mass of 1.8 kilograms held at the top of a uh, 3.6 meter curved track and release. When the car gets to the bottom, it's uh, it compresses a spring that has a K value of 2,032 newtons per meter for 0.25 meters before coming to rest. What's the total energy at the top? So we're, we're actually going to look at this scenario in, in parts where we're, now we're looking at the top. And then the next example, we're going to look at the bottom of the ramp. So we have all of our energies. we got the gravitational potential, but this time we have spring potential energy because now we have a spring that, uh, with a K value. And we have kinetic energy, and then we have the total energy that's uh, in our scenario. So we have, uh, first off, at the top, we have all gravitational potential energy, no spring energy, and no kinetic energy. So let's look at gravitational potential, uh, 1.8 times 9.8 times 3.6. That gives a total of uh, 63.5 joules. And then our spring energy is going to be zero because it's not compressed yet. So that's zero joules for spring potential energy. Kinetic energy is also going to be zero because at the top, it's not moving. It's held at the top and released. That means we have zero velocity at the top. So that means zero kinetic energy. So now we add these three together. We get a total of 63.5 joules at the top. Now we're going to look at this same scenario, but now at the bottom where it compresses the spring. So we have our energies again. We go ahead and, and divide these up. We've got the equation for each one of these. Uh, let's look at our gravitational potential energy. Our gravitational potential energy is going to be zero this time because now we're at the bottom. We have, um, we have zero height. That, uh, that, it, that it has, and it's going to be zero gravitational potential energy. The spring potential energy is one half times that K value. It's 2023 times 0.25 squared. That gives us a total of 63.5 joules of spring potential energy. The kinetic energy is actually, again, going to be zero because it starts from rest, but when it compresses the spring, then it's going to end at rest. And that's what it says right here. It says uh, comes to rest. So that means the kinetic energy is going to be zero. Now we take all of these energies and we add it together. We get 63.5 joules. So this shows that the amount of energy I start with in the previous problem at the top is converted over, but the total energy I end with is going to be the same. So we started with gravitational potential energy at the top, but then we end with spring potential energy at the bottom. All right, for our first example, it says a 2.5 kilogram mass is dropped from a 53 meter cliff. How fast will the mass be moving right before it hits the bottom of the cliff? All right, we're, we're dealing with different types of energies because I'm dealing with a changing height. And because I'm dealing with a changing height, I'm dealing with gravitational potential. And at the uh, 
when it hits the bottom, it's going to be moving. So that means with motion, we have a kinetic energy. So therefore, with two types of energies, that brings us to our conservation of energy equation. So I see here I have initial gravitational potential energy plus initial kinetic energy plus or minus any work that's done in the system is going to be equal to the final gravitational potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. So our first step in this is uh, rather than having this big, huge equation, we're going to go ahead and eliminate, cross out the things that we don't need. So we have a uh, height at the beginning, so we're going to have gravitational potential energy at the beginning. But it starts from rest because it's being dropped, so that means our initial kinetic energy is going to be equal to zero. We can go ahead and cross that out. Now in this process, we don't have any outside forces. We don't have friction or we don't have anybody pushing on it. So therefore, we don't have any outside work being done. Um, and then that's going to be equal to the final gravitational potential energy. We're going to end at the bottom. So that means our final gravitational potential energy is going to be zero. But it is going to be moving at the bottom. So we do have a final kinetic energy. So then we simplify our equation so that we just have this. The initial gravitational potential energy is going to be equal to the final kinetic energy. So mass times gravity times the initial height is going to be equal to one half times mass times the final velocity squared. So the first step in this process, again, is to eliminate those types of energies that are irrelevant to our, uh, our scenario, cancel those out, and make this, the equation a little bit more simple. All right, so we have our equation. Let's go ahead and plug in our numbers. We got uh, mass is 2.5 kilograms. The acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. The height initially is going to be 53 meters. And then we got one half times 2.5 times the final uh, speed squared. So on the left-hand side, we multiply that together. You get 1,298.5. And on the right hand side, you have one half times 2.5, which gives me which gives me 1.25. And then we divide both sides by that 1.25 to get, isolate our variable. That leaves us with the final velocity squared equals 1,038.8. We divide, I'm sorry, square root both sides. Square root both sides, and you get this final speed is going to be 32.2 meters per second. So that means that our mass is going to be moving at 32.2 meters per second at the end. This next example, it says a 3.0 kilogram mass is dropped from a 62 meter cliff. And on the way down, we have 700 joules of energy that is dissipated. How fast will the mass be moving right before it hits the bottom of the cliff? All right, so we start with the same equation, conservation of energy equation. We got the initial gravitational potential energy and the initial kinetic energy plus or minus any work done. is going to be equal to final gravitational potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. Now we start with an initial height, so we have an initial gravitational potential energy, but it starts, starts from rest because it's dropped, so we know the initial kinetic energy is going to be zero. Uh, the next part is the work that's being done. Well, we know we have uh, work being done. We have 700 joules of work. Now, the question is, is it going to be positive work or is it going to be negative work? Which one is it going to be? Now, dissipated energy, if you remember, dissipated energy does negative work. It takes energy out of the system. So we're going to have our negative for this work. And then that's going to be equal to the final gravitational potential energy. It's going to, again, it's going to be at the bottom. So that means we're going to have a final gravitational potential energy of zero. We'll go ahead and cross that out. And then the final kinetic energy energy, well, it's going to be moving right before it hits the ground, so we have a final kinetic energy. Now, to simplify this equation, we got uh, the gravitational potential energy at the beginning, mass times gravity times the initial height, minus the work being done is going to be equal to one-half times mass times the final velocity squared. Go ahead and plug in our numbers. We get 3 times 9.8 times 62 minus our 700 joules of dissipated energy. Energy is going to be equal to 1 half times 3 times the final speed squared. So then on the left-hand side, we do the 3 times 9.8 times 62, get 1,822.8. Subtract off that 700, and then that's going to be equal to half of 3, which is 1.5 times the final velocity squared. Subtracting that 700 from 1822.8, you get 1122.8. Now we divide both sides by 1.5 to give us our final velocity squared is 748.5 square root both sides and we get the final speed is going to be 27.4 meters per second now what's interesting about this is this started from a higher height from 62 meters than the previous example but we end with us with a lower speed and the reason we end with a lower speed is because we have this 700 joules of dissipated energy in the process so our mass is going to be moving at 27.4 meters per second